Good morning, Rockridge Church. Thank you so much for joining us for another Sunday. Do me a quick favor. If you're a member of this church, go ahead, pull your phone out right now. Open up to your calendar. Scroll over into December. Hover over December 13th. You're going to put a note there because December 13th is the annual business meeting for this church. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting, but trust me, it is. During this business meeting, that's when we get to look at the proposed budget for next year. We get to talk about what some of our new priorities might be for the next year. And that's when we get to see who wants to be overseers, that is, you know, elders, leaders in this church for the next year. We'll be talking about some of our new ministry ideas, as well as just taking a look at, at what we hope happens here at Rockridge Church in 2021. It's a chance for us to get together, make our voices heard, pray over the future of this church, and, and just see what God's going to do among us. So you will be getting a ballot on that day to vote on the budget, yes or no, and to vote on the overseers, yes or no. That's your chance to make your input known to us, the church leadership, and to really shape the future of what this church is going to be for the next year. So December 13th is a pretty big deal in the life of this church. If you're a member, please don't miss it. Don't miss out on this chance to, again, make your voice heard and be a part of what this church is going to be doing going forward. With that said, I'm going to hand it off to Chris now as he starts us off with some musical worship.
Thanks, Chris. Now, for the rest of us, it's time to pick up our Bibles. Go ahead and crack them open to the Psalms. The Psalm you're looking for this morning is Psalm 128. That is Psalm 128, close to the end of the book. Again, it's Psalm 128 we're going to read together this morning. So take a second to find that. And let's read it together. Blessed is everyone who fears Yahweh, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears Yahweh. Yahweh bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Let's pray together. Lord, the, the desires, the prayers of the psalmist here are so simple, but so foundational and so common among your people today. Lord, I pray that everyone in this church would get to see the prosperity of your people. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would get to see your people blessed. I pray that everyone here joining us in this prayer would get to meet their children's children and that there would be just so many of them. Lord, whatever a, a blessing means for someone's life right now, I just pray that, that you'd shower us with many blessings. Lord, we beg you for your mercy. We beg you always for your forgiveness. And Lord, we just ask for good things today. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ, we beg for your mercy and goodness. Amen. You guys remember Thanksgiving? It was only a few days ago. On Thanksgiving evening, I had the great pleasure of spending my evening with a few of the families in our church. I was over with the Schroders, and as we often do when we get together, uh, we started talking about some of our favorite movies. And when I started talking about some of my favorites, of course, it was a list of absolute winners, you know, Rambo and, and Blade Runner, a whole bunch of Clint Eastwood movies. And as I started to name off some of the best movies I had ever seen, I, I started to notice something. I had sort of a pattern because almost all of them were telling sort of a story beneath the surface level story. What was shown on screen was only part of what the film's creators were actually trying to communicate to the audience. For instance, one of my all-time favorites, pretty close to the top actually, is The Terminator. Now, 
On the surface, it appears to be a very typical 1980s action movie. There's explosions and there's car chases and of course the whole movie centers around this great big battle between the story's heroes and its villain. And of course there's Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's kind of the king of this big blockbuster Hollywood action. So on the surface, it's this very tight, suspenseful action thriller about a mild-mannered woman who's being hunted by a killer robot from the future. And she's being protected by a human warrior who's, of course, also from the future. Now, it has a veneer of simplicity. It's easy to get from A to B in this movie. But there's also a challenging message hidden just under that layer of simplicity. The real story being told is actually a huge warning about the rapid advance of technology given, by the way, to the first generation of humans to have computers in the home and in the workplace. It's a challenging message to not become too dependent on machines and artificial intelligence. In its bleak vision of a future war between humanity and our robot creations, the Terminator challenges people to wonder if we are actually in danger already of creating things that will eventually spiral out of our control. Now that's pretty deep stuff for a big budget summer blockbuster from 1984. If you haven't seen it, why don't you go ahead and ask your Amazon Alexa or your Google Nest to pull it up for you at home so you can see how clearly we've heeded this movie's warning. In its own way, the Terminator and stories like it function as sort of a modern version of a parable. And, and now you understand why I'm talking to you about movies from 20 plus years ago. The stories don't have all of their meaning and all of their purpose right there on the surface. They use the images and the characters that they present to you to illustrate new and, and powerful concepts or, or a challenging message for the audience. So this week, as we start on Matthew 13, what we're going to see is Jesus telling a lot of these parables to his disciples. He is revealing truths about the kingdom of heaven that only his disciples would understand because they're sort of hidden under this veneer of a story. This week, we're going to encounter the parable of the sower, but we're going to jump ahead a little bit first in Matthew 13 to find the disciples asking Jesus why he speaks in parables like this so that he can explain to us, his modern disciples, a little bit more about what parables are, how they work, and indeed why he does use them. So let's head now to Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. Again, it's Matthew 13, 10 that you're looking for. Let's read that together. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So the disciples pose this question to Jesus right after he finishes telling the parable of the sower. So like some other great movies, we're beginning sort of in the middle of the story this morning, but we will work our way back to the beginning. Jesus' answer to their question says a lot to them about parables, namely what they do and why he uses them. So like so many great stories, a parable conceals its true message under layers of imagery. The meaning isn't obvious and it's not communicated directly. It has to be interpreted and it has to be explained by the speaker who creates them. That's why we see Jesus breaking down each important detail of the parable of the sower later on in Matthew 13, so that his audience, the audience beyond his disciples, can catch the message that he's conveying. The mystery of parables is part of their power and part of their purpose. Jesus tells his disciples that they can understand the parables, but other people can't. 
While the rest of the crowd needs the parables interpreted for them, Jesus says his followers should be able to truly see and hear them, to be able to discern the truths hidden beneath the images. Now, this isn't an accident, that's by design. So if you're wondering, well, gee, are we saying that the same thing is not revealed to everybody, that, that it's Jesus' followers, his disciples, who sort of get the special understanding of things? Well, the answer is yes. Jesus is using parables to reveal things about the kingdom of heaven to the people who are pursuing that kingdom. Not everyone in Israel, not everyone who encountered Jesus and his ministry understands or even wants the kingdom of, of heaven. Jesus' ministry and message so far has been met with mixed reactions there in Israel. The ones who truly understand the kingdom and want it become disciples. They're the ones who, who are able to grasp this idea. The ones who don't understand the kingdom and want it, their priorities are elsewhere. They're pursuing other things. It's on this basis that people either understand the parables or they don't. They're either given the revelation, they're either given the understanding or they're not. Jesus' followers they, they understand and embrace Jesus' message about the kingdom so that when they hear the parables, they can hear and understand and connect with the kingdom truths in the story. I think much of the reason that people beyond the crowd don't get the parables, other than the fact that, yes, there is some of God's special revelation being done here, Part of the reason they don't get it is because the kingdom, it, it does subvert so many of our very human expectations of things. It gives us a whole other set of ethical values that are about serving God and loving God and serving neighbor. And it's so extreme that it's not stuff we would arrive at naturally. So when we hear about these kingdom ethics, when we hear what a kingdom citizen is supposed to be like, uh, unless it's something we want and it's something we're pursuing, it's not the kind of thing we'll fully understand because it goes against so many of our very human, very fleshly desires and assumptions. I think that's the reason much of the crowd doesn't understand or agree with Jesus' messages about the kingdom, especially when they're communicated in parables. So when they hear Jesus talking about a sower, or when he's talking about weeds and crops growing up together, or when he's talking about a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep to go pursue one, they don't make the connection between the story and the kingdom values concealed within because they really have no desire for the kingdom. What Jesus says next in Matthew 13 quotes directly from Isaiah chapter 6, particularly verses 9 through 10. It's a prophecy that Jesus says is being fulfilled in him. We'll head next to Matthew 13, verse 13. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So what Jesus says here is that God has revealed himself and his kingdom in such a way that just like in the Israel of Isaiah's time, only some people are going to understand it. By calling Isaiah's prophecy fulfilled, Jesus says that this is actually part of God's sovereign will, that he intends to reveal himself in such a way so that only some will actually be able to grasp it and understand understand it and accept it, while others can't or they won't. All have eyes, right? But only some are truly seeing. All have ears to hear the message, but only some will truly hear and understand it. Now, Jesus has actually talked about this before in Matthew's gospel, this idea of, of sort of a special or selective revelation. If you go back to Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, you'll find Jesus praying, and this is what he says there. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Now, it might sound here like this kind of revelation is only true about the parables. 
that that oh the parables must be layered in such complex meaning and, and coded messages that only the disciples understand it but if you really stop and think about it this pattern of some people understanding and some not has actually been true about Jesus's ministry all throughout Matthew's gospel going back to the beginning Jesus's ministry began with a very direct upfront message repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now some people got that message but many didn't some people heard that and followed, but many rejected it. His ministry continued on with more detailed ethical teachings like the Sermon on the Mount. And he was doing miracle healings, performing signs for Israel. And again, some people were able to see that, and some people were able to truly see that. Some people were able to hear those teachings. Some people were able to truly hear and understand them. Some people understood what was being revealed to them about the kingdom of heaven, but unfortunately, many did not. So what's true about the parables is the same thing that's true about the rest of Jesus' teaching and revealing and healing kingdom ministry. This is one of the many blessings that comes with being a part of Jesus' true family, that adopted family we talked about last week, being one of Jesus' people. We have set our minds on kingdom things. We want the kingdom. We are working to understand the kingdom. There are many things we know about the kingdom. We've heard and listened to Jesus' teachings. We know what it means to be a kingdom citizen. We know some of what it's expected of us. We're trying to think in kingdom ways in our everyday life. So by being one of Jesus' followers, we're learning to think like him. Will we ever achieve it perfectly? No, probably not, but we are working on it. We're doing our best to imitate him and therefore to live out these kingdom ethics. We also have the Holy Spirit as our helper and our guide. He helps us to see and hear the kingdom stuff that Jesus is revealing in his parabolic storytelling. So it's one of the many blessings that that we can discern the kingdom truths that are being communicated through parables because we're already trying our best to think in that kingdom way. So we can identify the ideas being communicated in a parable like the parable of the sower or the lost sheep or the prodigal son. So now that we know a little bit more about what parables are and why Jesus uses them so that his disciples will get these messages. Let's take a look at the first of Jesus' parables that we're going to be going through together. This is the parable of the sower. So turn now to Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. Again, it's Matthew 13, 3. That's where this parable begins. Take a second to find that. And let's read that together. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since it had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now before we get too deep into interpretation, I just want you to sit and think about the parable itself. Just sit and think about the story that Jesus has just told for a second. When Jesus' original audience heard this, there was a gap between their hearing and the interpretation that Jesus gave to them. And in that gap, they had to think. And they had to think about what these images might mean. So let's try our best as, as a modern audience for Jesus to do the same. Let's just sit and think about this stuff for a second. Now, while you're thinking, maybe here's some good guiding questions for you to be asking. What's the main focus of the story, of the parable? What objects or characters are in the center? What's being talked about the most? What's happening in the parable? What kingdom things might Jesus be revealing here? Do you hear in this parable ideas that Jesus has talked about in other places? And finally, what is this parable saying to you? personal question. What's this parable saying to you? 
Is it calling you to anything in particular? So as you think about these questions, I'm just going to read the parable for you again. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil that produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So think through some of those questions in the second reading. And now let's get to Jesus' interpretation and see what he has to say to his disciples here as he unravels and unpacks the mystery. So though we traditionally call this parable the, the parable of the sower, Note that the parable doesn't really focus on that character. We asked what's talked about the most. What's, what's the main central objects of the story? Well, you probably noticed in our reading, the stuff that gets talked about the most here is the soil and the seed. That's where our attention is drawn to more than anything else. And when Jesus breaks down the parable, he revisits each place where the sower scattered seed, and he reveals the hidden meaning behind each image. So we'll head first to Matthew 13, 18, where Jesus begins unraveling the mystery for his audience. Here's Matthew 13, 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And we'll pause there for now. Jesus has taken us back to the first scene of the parable, the hard-packed dirt along the path, where the scattered seed really couldn't settle in, and it was immediately taken away by birds. Now, according to Jesus' interpretation, this soil represents people who, they hear the message, right? They hear about the kingdom of heaven, and they just don't, they don't get it. Or, or even if they hear it, and, and maybe they're understanding it, they don't accept it. They reject it. The birds in this scene represent Satan, according to Jesus, or the evil one in his language, who swoops in and with all of his evil influence, stamps out whatever slim chance there might have been for these seeds to settle in and take root. And that's precisely the kind of thing we saw going on back in Matthew chapter 12. Remember, it was in that chapter that Jesus healed a mute man, and the crowds who witnessed that are starting to wonder if they're watching the Messiah at work. They're asking the right questions. Could this be the son of David? And immediately the Pharisees step in and shut them down. Their propaganda machine starts working, and they say, no, not only is he not the son of David, he gets his power from evil sources. In fact, he works hand in hand with Satan himself. Now, for every person who heard the objections of the Pharisees and stopped believing that day, stopped asking good questions, there was another seed taken away from the soil and devoured by these ravenous birds. Another chance at eternal life was snuffed out by evil people, indeed by the evil one. We'll continue on to the next scene of the parable in Matthew 13:20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately he falls away. Let's pause there again. All right, here's the second scene of the parable. Seed gets scattered on ground, but it's mostly rocks. It has trouble penetrating through to the soil. There's a little bit of life that, that arises from the scarce soil, but the soil's not deep enough to really let it take root in anything. It's, the plant is not strong enough to survive exposure to the elements, namely to the hot sun, and it all gets scorched and dies before any fruit can be born. 
Now in this scene, Jesus reveals what would actually be a pretty common theme for the early church, that many people would fall in love with the message initially. There'd be something about this kingdom message and ministry that would be very attractive to them at first. Maybe they were wowed by the miracles. Maybe they were attracted to new wisdom. They just wanted to come and learn all of this new stuff that's being handed down. Maybe they saw the large crowds and they said, hey, uh, I need community. I want to go be part of this community, be part of Wow, they call themselves a family? This is something I want to hang out with. But there's no real love for the kingdom here. That self-sacrificial devotion to Jesus and the kingdom of heaven, it's just not there. The desire for the gospel is only on like a superficial level. It's the difference between following Jesus because we love him and because we want to pursue him and we think he's just the best thing ever, and following Jesus because we're in love really with our own happiness and, and good feelings, and we know that we can get that from him and from his people. This is like after Jesus feeds the 5,000 in John's gospel in chapter 6. There's a group of people who actually go out looking for him. They go to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they find him, Jesus knows their intentions, and he tells them in John 6:26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, but not because you saw signs, not because you're convinced I might be the Messiah, but because you had your fill of the loaves. Jesus tells them that, that they are seeking him out, but it's not for the right reasons. They're not looking for him because there's a chance that he might really be what he says he is, because there's a chance that he might really be the savior of the world. They're following him because there's a chance that they might be able to pick up another free lunch that he's going to feed them yet again. It's not him they're pursuing. It's the good stuff that seems to follow him around. We see this kind of soil talked about in the opening chapters of Revelation quite a bit. Those opening chapters that contain the letters to the seven churches. More than anything, Jesus encourages those churches to faithfulness, to endure persecution, and to become conquerors in his own words people worthy of the white robes of victory that will be thrown on top of them in heaven it's a central theme of some of the earliest chapters in church history that follow the book of acts remember for the first 300 years that this faith existed it was illegal in the roman empire where most christians were living to actually be one so many potential brothers and sisters were lost along the way when they were brought before the courts and asked if they confess Christianity. So many capitulated because they feared the pain, even death that would follow, and they worshipped the emperor. We have some beautiful, dramatic stories of the people who actually held fast to their faith. Some of the most wonderful, amazing stories of true faith that we have in early church history are stories of the martyrs. And you could say that they all end tragically, but truthfully, they all end with, with good and faithful servants going to meet their Savior in heaven. It's this kind of rocky soil faith that Jesus was talking about when he spoke about people falling away because of end times persecution. He takes the veil off and talks about that in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate each other. Now, sadly, this is an experience that we saw happen in Jesus' own time, that we saw happen in the generations that immediately followed him, and, and that we see, out, we see play out in every generation until Jesus returns. The rocky soil presents itself every time a believer, whether they're a new believer or an old-time, long-time church-going believer, walks away from the faith specifically because some kind of persecution presents a threat that is bigger than their devotion or bigger than their faith or bigger than their trust in Jesus. If we're only chasing Jesus for the loaves instead of for the living bread of life, then of course we'll fall away when someone who presents a, a more brutal threat comes in our face and says, hey, do you really confess Christianity? Jesus continues with his interpretation of the parable in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. 
This is the third scene. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This time, Jesus is speaking about people. They don't fall away because of persecution necessarily, but there's temptation of a different type that arises. We find this kind of soil represented in stories like, like the rich young man who we'll encounter in Matthew chapter 19. The main beats of that story are that there's a wealthy young man who comes to Jesus and he asks him, hey, teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him, essentially, uphold the best values of the Torah. And the rich man says, well, I, I do all that stuff. I know the law and I follow it to a T as best I can. What do I still not have? What's not in my portfolio? And that's when Jesus gives him the challenging kingdom part of the answer. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, that is, if you would be complete, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had many great possessions. Now, Jesus told us that this soil gets so choked by thorns and that it represents people who are lured away from their discipleship by the temptation of wealth and, and worldly power and luxury. These are people who, just like that rich young man, when they hear that they can't serve both God and mammon, that is money, that is power, that is access, they actively choose for the mammon and against Jesus. When there's competition for their loyalty and for their attention, they will abandon the pursuit of discipleship and they will abandon seeking the kingdom and they will choose to pursue comfort and power. They want treasure in this world more than they want treasure in heaven. And we'll get to the last scene of the parable where Jesus brings his interpretation to an end in Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So the parable ends on a high note. Jesus declares to his disciples that even though many will fail to hear the message and, and understand it and accept it, many will fail to become brothers and sisters in the family, there's still reason for hope because in every generation, in every situation, there is good soil out there. Good soil can be found. Yeah, a lot of people will fail to get this. There will always be some out there, though, who do get it and who want it, who eventually, they don't just bear fruit, they don't just become brothers and sisters, they become sowers themselves, scattering the kingdom message wherever they go. They start spreading seed on their own and making even more production. More fruit becomes available because of them. Now, we should probably note here that what distinguishes the good soil from the path and from the rocky soil and the thorny soil is that, that it bears fruit. There's been a constant theme here throughout Matthew's gospel of, of knowing a tree, knowing false prophets, knowing good soil, really knowing a true disciple, a true brother or sister by the fruit that they bear. And it's alive here in the parable of the sower, too. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus immediately follows this parable with another one. He starts talking about other stuff in parables and telling more stories. But we have a chance here, now that we understand what all the images mean, thank you Jesus for that helpful interpretation, clearing all that stuff up for us, but we have a chance now to stop and consider not just what the parable means, not just what is Jesus saying, but what it has to say to us as Jesus' people right now. Here's what I think the biggest thing it says to us is. Each of the four scenes that Jesus laid out for us has a different kind of soil, and all of them except for the good soil have a different kind of threat. You'll probably notice that, that the fruit, it doesn't fail in the, the other kinds of soil because there's something inherently bad about the soil. There's always some opposition. There's always some kind of threat or some kind of enemy force working against it, whether it's birds or the hot sun or the thorns that choke it out. There, there's always something else at work. And just like there are different kinds of hearers, there are different kinds of soil. And just like there are different kinds of environmental threats, there are different kinds of spiritual opposition forces at work. 
There are birds by the road. There's scorching heat from the sun. There's thorns that choke out the seed in every generation and every situation. And Jesus' interpretation reveals those things to be Satan, persecution, and the temptations of worldly wealth. Those things are always alive and present in this world. This parable then should compel us to always offer radical patience and compassion with the people who we are discipling. This parable should tell us that they are up against so many things, earthly things and spiritual things, that the threat of persecution might be pressuring them to abandon the quest that they've started on with you, to, to walk away from all this kingdom stuff and go back to life as normal. Or maybe they are facing the temptations of worldly wealth and power. Maybe that's constantly at the door available to them and it's pushing in on them and the pressure's growing and, and they want to be wealthy and powerful. They want to provide for their families, for their kids and grandkids and, and there's a chance for them to do it, but man, to do it, they have to walk away from this kingdom stuff that they started on. Or maybe it's even it's Satan himself. Maybe it's the father of lies the accuser that's moving against them. Maybe that's what they're up against. This parable should remind us as Jesus' people that the people who were discipling, there's so much evil stuff pressing in on them. There's so much temptation out there. There's so much opposition out there. Satan's been defeated, but his work in this generation still matters. There's still influence out there. So we don't look the other way when they stumble, right? We're called to be honest disciplers and good stewards and good shepherds. We don't pretend like their backsliding doesn't exist and just pat them on the back and say, oh, it's okay. It's okay. This, it doesn't matter that you made a little mistake here or there. It does mean that we address those things, but not in a way that seeks to crush them or to abandon them. It means that we seek to restore them instead of condemn them. It means that when they stumble, even when they stumble the hardest, that's when we're there for them the most. Because we are the compassionate people of God. And if the soil that we're trying to work on, if it's not bearing fruit, then maybe we need to help chase the birds away. Maybe our discipling should be working on the land a little bit and getting rid of some of these threats. We've got to break up the rocks so that the soil can get more of more depth so that the seed can take roots. We got to help clear the thorns out. We're laborers in the field. Pastor Mike said in one of this, his sermons, it's one of the most brilliant things I think I've ever heard said, he was talking about discipleship as being this very personal, long, hard-fought experience. And he said, if you're going to disciple people, you need to be prepared to have your heart broken. And it's one of the most dead-on right things I think he ever said in his time here. When the soil doesn't yield the fruit that we want to see, that we know God wants to see, we can't just abandon the project. We don't just walk away from the field and call it a loss. We roll up our sleeves, and with compassion and patience and love, some of the highest kingdom ethics we can talk about, we get our hands dirty, and we clean up the field. We put in that time. We give it our attention. We put in the work. And the whole time, we do it on the understanding that maybe that fruit's not going to come for a long time. And maybe there's going to be a lot of pain here for us and for the person we're discipling. But we're called to do this. And of course, this parable calls us to look inward and wonder. What kind of soil are we? Which of these four scenes best represents us? Now this is a good question to ask if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, if you're a brand new Christian, if you've been a veteran Christian for over 30 years. Yes, even the most battle-tested Christians, the ones who have overcome temptation so many times, uh, who have stuck with the faith for so long, even there's a chance here for you to sit and reflect on this parable. Because note that even in the good soil, there's a difference in what the seed produces. So let's say you are that person, and a lot of this church is, and you've, just, you've been a Christian for most of your life, certainly most of your adult life. It's done a lot of great things. 
But consider, if you, if you hear this parable and you say, well, I think I'm most like the good soil. First of all, awesome. What a blessing that is. But consider how the seed has grown roots in you, the fruit that you've produced. Are you a 30? Are you a 60? Are you a 100-fold? Are there opportunities here for even greater fruitfulness? Can you offer the sower even more fruit? Can you serve the Lord in even greater ways? Are you in that beautiful chapter of life that we call retirement? And, and maybe you're looking for new ways to serve. Maybe you're looking for even new ways to bear more fruit for your God. And if you're not the good soil, if you've heard this parable and you're thinking, you know, I'm much more like one of these other scenes. If you're not the good soil, what are the thorns holding you back? What are the birds just just out of view that are waiting to come after you? What are the rocks that are taking away your depth? How do you make the soil deeper and richer so that these roots can grow and that you can start to bear fruit too? This is a family. This is a family of workers in the field. We are commissioned and sent to scatter seed and foster growth. And as we close out our time together, let's pray for even more good soil. Lord Jesus, we, we look to you as, as the head sower here, as, as the chief farmer in charge of all of the fields of the world. And Lord, we know there's a lot of rocky soil and thorny soil and soil just off the path. But Lord, we pray that, that all of those fields would be transformed into good soil. That you would show us how to do this work well and, and send us to these, to these fields that aren't producing fruit so that we can join you. We can join your work. We can roll up our sleeves and be your laborers and tend these fields and clean them up and, and, and put in the time and the effort and the energy to, to watch fruit grow. So that we can be on mission with you, Lord. And we just beg you that, that we would bear witness to many fields bearing much fruit. And that even among this family, we would bear even more fruit. We want to be more of the hundredfold than the 60 or the 30. And we ask for that as a blessing, as a gift from you. Let us be more faithful. Let us do more of your will. Let us serve you in greater and more powerful ways. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Your next step for this week is pretty simple. Just go back and read the parable of the sower again. This would be your third time going through it this week. Which soil best represents who you are and your situation? What about the people who you're discipling? What soil are they most like? And say a prayer. Pray that we would all yield more fruit and scatter more seed. With that, I'm going to hand it back off to Chris for another round of musical worship. Thank you so much for your time and your attention this week. Feel free, if God so moves you, to head to our website at rockridgechurch.org and give to support this ministry. You'll find two giving options there. We, of course, appreciate any tithings and gifts you can offer. And thank you so much for your faithfulness to this family and its various ministries. With that said, I can't wait to see you again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Now, let's worship together. Fears jealous for me Love's like a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy and all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and i realize just how beautiful you are
for me. 